That was whether legalizing marijuana would improve uh, the economy and job creation. I don't know what this says about the online audience. But <laughs> uh, the answer is no, I don't think that is a good strategy to grow our economy. So. Nearly one million lives wrecked by a marijuana arrest every year, Mr. President. Politely tell President Obama what you think about legalization by calling the White House at 202 456 1111. Now it's time for your 420 headline news. I'm Russ Belville. The Supreme Court in action boosts the right to record police officers, reporting from the Huffington Post. On Monday, the U.S. Supreme Court declined to review a decision by the 7th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals blocking the enforcement of an Illinois eavesdropping law. The 7th Circuit Court found a specific First Amendment right to record police officers. It's the second federal appeals court to strike down a conviction for recording police. In August of 2011, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit ruled that a man wrongly arrested for recording cops could sue the arresting officers for violating his First Amendment rights. That decision also found a broad First Amendment right to record on-duty government officials in public. Quote, gathering information about government officials in a form that can be readily disseminated to others serves a cardinal First Amendment interest in protecting and promoting the free discussion of government affairs. End quote from the decision. And in fact, in that it strips police who make such arrests of their immunity from lawsuits, it's an even stronger opinion. The First and Seventh Circuit decisions mean that it is now technically legal to record on-duty police officers in every state in the country. Medical marijuana laws may put officials at risk, says the Congressional Research Service. This from FierceGovernment.com. While state medical marijuana laws are legally valid, they may expose state officials to federal criminal liability, says the Congressional Research Service. Since federal sanctions also apply to those, quote, who conspire, aid, and abet, or assist, end quote, in the possession, production, or distribution of marijuana. For example, a state law that requires officials to return medical marijuana improperly seized from a qualified individual could qualify as a felony under the Controlled Substances Act, says the report. The Tenth Amendment stops Congress from forcing states to enact specific laws or using state resources to enforce federal laws, but doesn't necessarily afford protections for actions that violate federal laws. An accountant's indictment tossed in a medical pot cake case from san francisco gate.com sfgate.com federal prosecutors unlawfully obtained an indictment against a missoula medical marijuana providers accountant by using statements she made when she was immune from prosecution a judge has ruled u.s district judge dana christensen threw out the indictment against lisa fleming on tuesday fleming was the accountant for jason washington a former montana grizzlies quarterback who ran big sky health until his arrest last year in a federal crackdown on large medical marijuana providers. Washington's trial is scheduled for December 10th. If it goes forward, Washington will be only the second medical marijuana provider to stand trial as a result of the long-running crackdown on large medical marijuana operations that has netted dozens of providers. The first, Chris Williams of Helena, was convicted of eight drug and gun charges and faces a possible prison term of 80 years or more when he is sentenced in January. New Jersey patients hopeful that the last hurdle has been cleared for medical marijuana. This from Philly.com. New Jersey health officials were upbeat on the day they announced that they were creating a long-awaited patient registry allowing seriously ill people to receive medical marijuana. Within a couple of weeks, they predicted, eligible patients would be able to buy marijuana from the state's first dispensary, Greenleaf Compassion Center. That was more than three months ago. For many patients, the last 90 days of waiting have been especially trying. They paid their $200 registration fee in August, their photo IDs arrived the next month by FedEx, and then silence. So far, 318 patients have enrolled in the state's program. An additional 138 are still getting their doctors to certify their eligibility or have not yet paid the fee. Health officials said patients won't be credited for lost months. 
There was a delay when the state required Greenleaf to submit its plants for testing for fungus, pesticides, and potency. The Christie administration wanted THC, the euphoria-producing ingredient in the drug, to be reduced to 10% to prevent abuse. Feds demand marijuana records from a Northern California county. This from San Jose Mercury News. Federal investigators are demanding records related to a Northern California county's medical marijuana permitting program. Mendocino County Sheriff Tom Allman told new local news outlets this week that county officials received a subpoena in October from the U.S. Attorney's Office in San Francisco. The records request is connected to the county's now canceled program to authorize certain marijuana growers to grow as many as 99 plants, exceeding the local limit of 25 plants. The permit the permitting process garnered more than $800,000 in county fees in its two-year existence. Officials canceled the program in January after the U.S. Attorney's Office threatened legal action. And that's your 420 headline news for today, Wednesday, November 28, 2012. I'm Russ Belville. When we come back, we go behind the headlines at the latest normal National Board of Directors meeting and the vote on Executive Director Alan St. Pierre. I'm Sub Cool from Team Green Avenger. At TGAgenetics.com, we are working on the leading edge of medical strain. Our strains are rigorously tested for THC, CBD, THCV, and other critical cannabinoids. Know your grow. Check out our genetic diversity at TGAgenetics.com. The home of Jelly Bean, Jack the Ripper, Vortex, and other award-winning cannabis strains. The Russ Belleville Show reminds you to never smoke and drive impaired. Hang out for a while. Share. I think we're back. Take a little trip. Take a little trip. Take a little trip. All right, we're taking a little trip behind the headlines here. And uh, if you've been following the show since we did our normal national conference coverage, you may know that the executive director of Normal, the longest serving executive director in not just drug reform nonprofit history, but as far as I know, in nonprofit history, he may be the longest serving executive director in nonprofit history since 1994. I believe Alan St. Pierre has been the head of the Normal Foundation and in 2000 or 2001 became the head of Normal. This uh, national conference that just recently took place uh, brought to a head some conflicts that had uh, concerned some of the members of the board of directors. And uh, I was there uh, in the hallway when I, I heard a couple of the members of the board fighting over this very issue and uh, expressing the fact that it would have to be brought up at the full board of directors meeting that it, that the executive uh, committee could not just take unilateral action. And the unilateral action that was proposed by the executive committee was the formation of a board to begin a search for a new executive director, or in other words, to replace Alan St. Pierre. Uh, St. Pierre was very uh, non-responsive uh, at, the, at the conference when I attempted to talk to him about this. He gave a very fiery speech uh, to close the national conference, which we have up on our uh, YouTube website at Radical, Radical Russ on YouTube, just youtube.com slash Radical Russ, uh, in which he expressed he had reached a nadir or a low point in working with normal. Now, a couple of these uh, points that led to what would be called the nadir uh, have to do with information that was published on Steve Bloom's Celeb Stoner blog, uh, celebstoner.com, and they were remarks that were part of a private conversation on the normal legal committee listserv. Now, if you don't know about this, Normal's legal committee is pretty much the heart and soul of Normal. It's about 500 different lawyers from across the country who pay a, a regular fee to Normal, an annual fee to be a part of the legal committee, which gets their names listed in Normal's national listing. So no matter what state you're in, if you needed a marijuana lawyer, they've got the hookup for you uh, in whatever state you may be. Part of that is a listserv, an email group, if you will, uh, to collaborate on various uh legal defenses and theories uh, among these lawyers. So if, say, a lawyer in Kansas figures out a novel new way to beat a drug dog search, 
he can communicate with a lawyer in Kentucky and explain how he did it. So this this listserv had been a, lo a long part of this community. Now, as it turns out, part of the debate that went on on this listserv had a lot to do with um, what I could describe as kind of a divide between East Coast and West Coast activists. On the West Coast, we've had medical marijuana since 1996. We have a much more uh, liberal population with respect to marijuana and marijuana culture. And so as the medical marijuana industry has formed in California and Colorado mostly, uh, a lot of lawyers have become involved with that in helping their clients set up their, their medical marijuana distribution services, their uh, infused product manufacturing services, and so forth. You know, just basically helping the, uh, shall we say, business side of marijuana. And this has become quite natural and quite expected amongst the normal lawyers and amongst the activists in the medical marijuana states because, of course, a lot of the people involved with medical marijuana are legalizers. They want to, you know, just get marijuana legalized out and out. On the East Coast, there is a, a different phenomenon going on, and that is the fact that they live in a more restrictive uh, area. It's becoming less restrictive, but more restrictive, more culturally against marijuana. And as these reporters and activists and legislators look westward, and they hear the stories coming eastward about medical marijuana, they hear about the multi-pound bus of cars driving from California or Colorado loaded down with medical marijuana, they see the um, hyperbolic reports on TV news about how easy it is to get a card and how it's de facto legalization. And this scares the hell out of the people out on the east side of the country, and especially in the south or even in the Midwest. And so that leads the activists on that side of the country to have kind of a um, disrespectful attitude, if you will, toward the medical marijuana industry in some respects, and, and mostly in the respect uh, of it being kind of just a a way of getting around marijuana not being legal. Well, that attitude uh, came to a boil in a discussion that went was going down on the normal legal committee le list, wherein in response to someone defending California dispensaries and and some of the uh, the excesses that are going on there, you might say, um, or or you might express it as just people you know following the law since it's such a liberally written law. But in response to that, Alan St. Pierre wrote in an email uh, a very spirited uh, explanation as to how he found medical marijuana and defending the industry these days to be, and in his words, quote, a fraud and a sham. And he compared it to people that wrote uh, medicinal alcohol uh, prescriptions during uh, prohibition. This caused a big firestorm on the normal legal committee list. The uh, what got written there got published on Steve Bloom's celebstoner.com blog. And between that and a renewed interest in moderating the list to prevent the negative comments from boiling up about the medical marijuana comments, uh, there was a call for whether or not Alan St. Pierre should be replaced as the executive director. And I'm here to report uh, the latest update we've gotten from the Boston Pot Report, and I believe from one of the uh, board members who's uh, in tune with that Boston Pot Report, is that Alan St. Pierre has been retained by the normal board of directors in a 8 to 6 vote with one abstention. So from the 16-member board, of course, uh, he can't vote for, on himself. So out of the 15 left, eight votes for and six votes against. So Alan St. Pierre retains his chair, his uh, position as the executive director of the country's oldest and most respected marijuana legalization organization. <laughs> Well, some people get to keep their jobs, I suppose. <laughs> I think it's about time to take a break. Thankfully, Brian's here, and it looks like he's got something break-worthy. So yes, yes. stick around. It. We'll be right back. Oh, have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. Have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. If he said he swam to China, he would sell you South Carolina. Then you know you're talking to that reefer man. Hi, this is Dan Michaels. If you're looking for professional voice talent for your commercial or podcast, I'm your man. Visit danmichaelsaudio.com for more information. The Russ Belleville Show. 
Chat is for friends 18 and older. We expect our chat to be civil, mature, and free from excessive profanity. If you don't like these rules, there are approximately 6 billion other chat rooms with lower standards that you can visit. Everyone knows music and marijuana go together, so let's wind up our 20 after break with the Russ Belleville Show's Daily Toker Tunes, the best in pod safe 420 music from around the web. Today is Irie Wednesday, Scott, and other world music genres. You can get downloads and more information about all our Daily Toker Tunes by visiting music.radicalrust.com. Now, Sit back and enjoy your daily Toker tune. All right, on Wednesdays, we turn things over to Brian the Red, the host of Red Eyes Reggae Flashback, tonight at 8 o'clock Pacific Time Live. So take it away, Red Eyes. All right, well, coming up here, we got a little sample of uh, so the stuff we got for tonight. Uh, I was cleaning out some old CDs and things and found an archive of some old dub and things. So we're going to go ahead and get into some uh, random reggae music for smoking. Coolness. This is Gorilla Finger with Pipe Dreamin'. Again, pass it on to the left hand 
activist for 40 years. We are turning the corner on a failed policy that's been disastrous for our communities um, and things are going to get better. 80 years ago we repealed alcohol prohibition in this state. We did it prior to the federal government and we're doing the same thing when it comes to marijuana. We are uh, a step ahead and we will continue to lead the way. It means I'm going to smoke a lot of weed tonight. Woo! Some call it marijuana. You're listening to Radical Russ on the Russ Belleville Show. Marijuana is harmless. That's what everybody says these days. It's fun. It's recreational. Some even call it medicine. But every year, millions of young people find out that marijuana is extremely dangerous. Every year they find out that it's deadly. Marijuana smoke is lethal and toxic. Don't believe anything you've ever heard positive about smoking marijuana. It will kill you. Really. It's really gonna kill you. It's don't 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 smoke it. It will really, really kill you. Seriously. It's gonna kill you. It's time for the Russ Belleville Show's Cannabis Q&A with Dr. Mitch Earlywine. Dr. Earlywine is a professor of psychology at the State University of New York at Albany and a leading author and researcher on cannabinoids and health who pins the Ask Dr. Mitch column for High Times Magazine. Get your questions ready in our live chat or call in to 971-533-7111 now. All right, everybody, middle of the week, time to get your questions ready for Dr. Mitch Earlywine, who's standing by in New York State. How you doing, Dr. Mitch? Oh, wait a minute. It'll help if I unmute you. Let's try that again. How you doing, Dr. Mitch? Having a wonderful night. <laughs> Too much to concentrate on here. I'm glad you're having a good time. And as we always do here on the show, we remind you, you can get your live questions in here by joining our chat room. Just type slash login and create your account, and you can get your questions in. If you proceed them with Q colon it'll make a nice little icon makes it easy for us to find those questions also you can call in live here at 971-533-7111 the top of this segment we always give dr mitch a chance to fill us in on the latest science news and polling so what's up dr mitch what's new uh the big news is i've been invited to present at the tedx talks in brooklyn oh. on december 7th and uh, I've been focusing on that so much, I haven't really been able to pay attention to anything else. So the the TED Talks, I've seen a couple of these on uh, Huffington Post. I saw, I just saw one recently. It was a guy who did a, a virtual choir, had like a thousand people on YouTube all singing one song. Uh, what's the to what's your topic? I mean, I, I imagine it's marijuana related, but uh, what did they ask you to, to speak specifically about? It's interesting. I pitched them a, a thing about marijuana arrests, and they were less excited about that than the idea of humor and building community. So I'm actually going the humor 101 route. Oh, excellent. It's going to be strange to be in front of a crowd and not discussing the, the cannabis weed, though, I'll tell you. All right. All right. And that reminds me, of course, you've got the book uh, Humor 101 that's out there in the, uh, the psych series. Uh, that, I, I imagine that's still available. How can people get a copy? Indeed. So both the Springer website, the Amazon website, and your local brick and mortar bookstore. So uh, it's definitely available, and, and Springer's pretty excited about this talk, as you can imagine. All right. Looking forward to that. And uh, what I wanted to ask you about before our questions start rolling in from the uh, the chat room, uh, just recently we saw here in Portland – uh, the Oregonian did a story on Brave Michaela. She's a seven-year-old uh, medical cannabis patient. She's using it to help treat the uh, the effects of chemotherapy that she's undergoing for leukemia. That story got picked up by Huffington Post. 
And that story got picked up by ABC News and CNN. And now the whole country is talking about Michaela and other kids that are using uh, cannabis for medicinal purposes. I'm just wondering if you've ever met any of the kids, seen this in effect uh, personally, and what research we have, if any, on cannabis and children. I did meet one child in uh, Los Angeles who was experimenting with some edibles to control uh, what were basically some pretty extreme uh, Aspergery type symptoms and was having a, a pretty decent reaction. We don't have tons of long term data in humans on this. The cannabinoid system is pretty resilient. Uh, THC, of course, is, is not toxic, but we just don't know about the impact on the developing brain. We do have that one uh, data set from Peter Fried, F R I E D. Uh, longitudinal follow-up on some folks who started relatively early in life and saw some uh, modest decreases in IQ, but it's never been replicated and we're not sure what to make of it. And in all honesty, I mean, compared to dying of leukemia, I just can't imagine that a five-point drop in IQ is anything they really take very seriously. And, and as far as, you know, a child that's age seven going through leukemia, uh, you know, of course, all the pain, the nausea, all the symptoms they're going to face. What are some of the traditional drugs they would uh, recommend for that and some of their side effects? Well, so, I mean, as we, as we know, the first line of defense a lot of times with pain are either these prostaglandin-based drugs like aspirin that are supposed to just reduce swelling and kind of hope for the best, or moving to the opiate drugs, which, uh, unfortunately, we develop tolerance to pretty rapidly, and we have some pretty aversive uh, and, and odd nausea, as well as the, uh, the a legendary constipation. That, in fact, you know that's what the opiates were first used for, was to prevent diarrhea. And so it's uh, not that they don't have any brain effects either, but you're sort of just trading one set of side effects for this potential uh, cannabis-related maybe problem. I, I honestly can't tell somebody to turn to an opiate when uh, the plant could probably do just as well. One of the uh, confounding situations in, in trying to present this issue, and it, and it comes up, and, and I can see, I can kind of feel the mainstream media pushing this angle, maybe subtly, uh, is they point out that the, the, the mom and the stepdad, in Michaela's case, are both cannabis users themselves. And uh, they, they try to make this you know, subtle implication that this is really just a bunch of uh, you know, adult uh, cannabis users that are using their kid in order to uh, get through a, a medical marijuana program. Uh, I, I don't know how to phrase this into a question other than to say, you know, what what do we know about people that have, you know, chosen medical cannabis as an option for their kid? And, and statistically speaking, wouldn't it most likely be the ones who had tried it themselves? Well, it's funny because I had that sense from the way the media has covered, covered this as well. But who would think of using cannabis as a medicine first, right? If you're already primed, if you already view the plant as potentially beneficial, why wouldn't you think of it first, right? And we've seen this with adults uh, battling cancer chemotherapy side effects and things like that as well. The folks who are not familiar with the plan, of course, don't think of it. Just like, uh, you know, I don't know anything about opera, so I don't think about opera very much <laughs> either, but I do know about other forms of music and I think about them all the time. I, I, I kind of feel, uh, I, I just have some angst about the way this is presented as uh, some kind of backdoor route to obtaining cannabis when it's probably pretty obvious that these parents could access cannabis <laughs> any way they want without having to go through anything this aversive. And once your child has leukemia, sorry, man, all bets are off. Yeah. I feel like they should get to do whatever they need to do to make sure that this child has the best chance possible. Yeah, and the ABC News story did a good job of going back to a previous interview they had done with Dr. Lester Grinspoon. And, of course, you know, no better authority on using uh, medical cannabis for childhood leukemia than, than that man. Well, and Lester's really candid about that, and I feel like sometimes people overweigh that individual case, but they find him so compelling because he lived through it. Mm -hmm. So I, I would love to have data from 100 people who you know, had leukemia as children and how they adapted, uh, and I personally think that would be more persuasive. But, man, sometimes just listening to Lester tell that story about one person 
can be much more uh, moving than any any amount of graphs and charts and bar- arrows and boxes. Yeah, and I, I kind of think you know the the corollary to the you know the the pot parents with the cannabis kids is the non pot parents who wouldn't get it for their kids. I, I spoke to uh, Lindsay Reinhardt, and she's fighting for a medical marijuana bill in Idaho. And she talked about how, yeah, when I was a teenager, I had tried pot recreationally. And I'm glad that I did because that helped me realize I'd been lied to about it. And then I was, you know, not afraid to try it when I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. So, I mean, how many kids out there that are, their minds get poisoned by the D.A.R.E. program later become adults that could benefit from medical cannabis but will never try it because of the fear mongering? Well, and I know you've talked to Urban Rosenfeld about this in the past. I mean, he was you know, Captain uh, Drug-Free America as a teen, and then suddenly realized with the the strange bone tumors he has, there was just no other way. He really needed to have this. And I think he would have gotten into it a little earlier had we not been in the midst of some of the fear-mongering we had back in the 70s. All right. Well, we're going to get some questions here from our chat room. Uh, Guido in the chat room brings up a good point, and it references this uh, that Dunedin study, that New Zealand study, and this is being brought up by the opponents of, oh, my God, they're giving kids medical marijuana, who say, look at this study. They studied all these people, and they found there was an eight-point drop in IQ. If they used it when they were before age 15, they dropped eight points in IQ. And so Guido wants to know, is that even really statistically significant? Well, what's funny about statistical significance is, is if you get a big enough sample, you could make a two-point drop in IQ statistically significant because it's a product of both the sample size and the size of the effect. Now, I will be the first to admit eight points of IQ is a lot of IQ, and we all want to have as much as we can. But some of those tests, when you look closely at that study, aren't really what we call fluid intelligence, aren't really how fast do you learn and how much do you learn. It's stuff that you were supposed to have picked up by that age. Now, I will also be the first to admit that during, you know, immediately after cannabis use, the hippocampus is not firing in the same way, and you're not going to absorb new material. So if any of these kids were at school high, they did not remember the lessons well, and if that component was on the IQ test, which like the vocabulary section of the IQ test, of course, then they're going to miss it. And it may not be because of some inherent brain damage so much as they li- literally did not learn the thing they were supposed to learn because they were high in class. Oh, so like in a sense, if the IQ test was asking, you know, who was president during the Civil War and you were stoned at that point and didn't commit that to memory, that doesn't necessarily mean that later on in life, reading a book about the Civil War, you would not understand it or not mentally grasp what's going on. It's a question And in of- fact, you may learn just as fast as anyone else, but that's not what that part of the test is testing. What is better is often those block design type tasks or a task that's foreign that you have to learn a new skill. Mm -hmm. And then I can see how rapidly do you learn. And unfortunately, they did not publish the data in a way to help me separate that out. So the crystallized intelligence, the stuff that you should have learned by now, is kind of confounded with the fluid intelligence, the how rapidly do you learn in a given given setting. And we really don't know if cannabis has a a negative impact on that or not. Hmm. Um, so uh, something that I was uh, looking into when I was younger was uh, s- uh, something called conditioned learning because my father was uh, kind of wary about me consuming cannabis for my, uh, you know, my medical reasons, my anxiety, my depression, my anger issues. Um, and uh, he said that there was something called conditioned learning that uh, if you learn something while in an, a slightly altered state, then you're going to remember it just fine or be able to do that activity just fine in that altered state. But, you know, when you're in a different, you know, when you're not in that uh, zone as it is, uh, you know, in your... Uh, <laughs> yeah, the bottom line on this was state. anything you learned high, you're supposed to recall better only when you're high. But the the data on uh, basically state-dependent learning, as it's known formally, are not as strong as we were led to believe in, say, intro psych textbooks. So even the impact of caffeine on state-dependent learning, which was one of the ones that they used to make a big deal out of, is really pretty hard to replicate. And we don't have any data on state-dependent learning with cannabis, despite how popular this notion is. But odds are high, if there's something you want to know, go learn it. (laughs) By all means, I'm sure you can. Yeah, there's a lot of information out there. I found so much when I've been doing my medical uh, research, helping with patients. But, yeah, 
definitely. All right. Thanks for that. And uh, Dr. Mitch, we got another question uh, from the chat room. We'll have to wrap it up here. We're getting close to the end. And folks, if you didn't get a chance to get your question in or you want to just be more private about it, you can always email Dr. Mitch in confidence at 420research at gmail.com. That's 420research at gmail.com. Just Lily from our uh, chat room wants to know, what is your response to those like Kevin Sabat who say we need to turn cannabis into pills so that we can have consistency and so that the FDA can regulate it. Uh, Kevin, bless his heart, he really needs our love, doesn't he? I mean, <laughs> the poor guy, what, who, who, would, who would say that with a straight face? If this were a toxic substance where there's a lethal dose and you really have to be worried about that, I completely understand the argument. But we're not talking about cyanide. We're talking about a plant with a 5,000-year history of safety. We're talking about plants that we can actually uh, test ourselves now and get uh, an estimate of THC concentration and tell people that. Do we really need to have it turn into something you swallow, particularly if you're going to use it for nausea and vomiting, where you want that impact to be within seconds, not within hours? We need the vaporizer. We need the plant cannabis. We need something we can rely on to have an immediate impact so that the symptoms can disappear as quickly as possible. So one of the things that I bring up is uh, the oncoming pharmaceuticalization of cannabis and how we've got the different companies that are synthesizing all the cannabinoids, and they are going to get it into uh, you know, self-titrating type dosages where, you know, like an inhaler or a spray sublingually. So once we have that, once we have the extracted, measured, dosed, you know, uh, cannabis products that, that work as well as cannabis, what arguments will we have for keeping the whole plant? In all honesty, it kind of reminds me of back when the first George Bush was uh, told that broccoli is good for you, and he said, well, go find the thing in broccoli that's good for you because I don't like broccoli. <laughs> right? Yeah. Here's a plant with at least 60 novel compounds, the cannabinoids. We have no idea what's going on. We're going to have THC by itself or THC and cannabidiol mix. But why go through all this effort, for one thing, kind of begs the question. But also, I think it's unlikely that one strain, two strains, never mind one cannabinoid, two cannabinoids, will have all the medical properties that the whole plant has. When you talk to Steph Scherer or somebody you know, who's really appreciative of the fact that we have a variety of subspecies is so important because we have so many different symptoms that people need treatment for, I just shudder at the thought that there would be one pharmaceutical company that would have control over two cannabinoids, and we would say that would replace the plan. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think somebody in our chat room also hit the nail on the head with just one word, price. <laughs> Alas, but, you know, even, even when, you know, Marinol goes generic... You know, it's going to be three to five bucks a pill yeah. for what should be about a dime's worth of cannabis. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mitch, for joining us every Wednesday here on our Cannabis Q&A segment. We appreciate it more than you'll ever know. Have a great week. All right, folks. When we come back, we got time for a little bit of radical wow. ranting. Stick around. It's the Russ Belleville Show. Check us out on RadicalRush.com. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belvin Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Stokers, there's no good reason to get your dog stoned. While it might not harm them physically, imagine being a dog who already begs for treats all day, and then imagine that dog having the munchies. Not cool. Georgia. Hi, this is Willie Nelson, and I need your help. Our marijuana laws are terribly unfair, and they make criminals out of law-abiding citizens. Nearly 2,000 Americans are arrested every day on marijuana charges. And we are unfairly destroying the lives and careers of hundreds of thousands of people simply because they smoke marijuana. These are not criminals. They are average citizens like you, good neighbors who work hard, raise families, pay taxes, and contribute to their communities. And it's time we stopped arresting responsible marijuana smokers. We need your help to end marijuana prohibition once and for all. It's the fair thing to do. 
For more information, contact Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. Call toll-free 888-67-NORML or visit their website at NOR. my family I think I'm entitled you want answers I want the truth and you have offended a Shaolin temple you can't handle the truth surely you can't be serious I am serious and don't call me Shirley now that marijuana legalization has passed in two states it will be interesting to see how the battle for medical marijuana plays out in the legislatures and initiatives nationwide as the movement started in the 1990s, opponents claimed that it was the camel's nose under the tent for legalization. Medical marijuana is just a Trojan horse, they called it. <laughs> well, if it was a Trojan horse, it was made out of glass. Because medical marijuana is marijuana legalization. It's just for a limited subset of the consumers, that's all. Still, there's a gap of about 30% of the people. Between the 80% that support medical marijuana nationwide and the 50% that support legalization nationwide, that gap of about 30% of the people who can look the other way if it's a cancer patient smoking a joint, but they feel compelled to punish a healthy person if they're using marijuana. But now, now that we have two marijuana states, two legal marijuana states that started off as medical marijuana states, it's going to make that argument about, no, 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 really. Really, it's just for the sick people. That's going to be a really hard talking point to sustain, isn't it? Unless medical marijuana reformers go out of their way to make sure that it really is only for the sick people by ensuring that only the very sickest can get it after clearing some very high hurdles. Now that, in a nutshell, is the theory of the medical marijuana box canyon. It's the idea that if you fight only for medical marijuana, Marijuana has to become increasingly medical. Medical marijuana laws have to become increasingly restrictive in order to keep the potheads out. It's a look at the trends in medical marijuana legislation from 1996 to 2012, where we went from California, with hardly any limits at all, where almost anyone can get medical marijuana, to New Jersey, where it's been almost three years since the law passed, and patients who've just recently gotten their registry cards, are forbidden to grow at home. They have no place yet to shop for medicine. When they do, there will only be six dispensaries in the entire state of nine million people. And they will have a choice of just three varieties of medical marijuana, all with less than 10% THC per strain. It also takes into account the rapidly developing field of cannabinoid pharmaceuticals, the development and approval of which will neuter much of the argument for medical marijuana as a plant that patients grow for themselves. When patients can get a spray or an inhaler that works as well, works as fast as marijuana, and is legal and covered by health insurance, what incentive will there be for passing a medical marijuana law or initiative? Now, certainly... Certainly, medical marijuana in Colorado and in Washington opened people's minds to a different frame of marijuana, something other than dope. And that did help to pass marijuana legalization. It should be noted, however, that in both states, it was activists always dedicated to marijuana legalization and not just medical marijuana who led the successful legalization campaigns. And it should be noted that the primary opposition to the legalization campaigns came from the activists who've always been devoted primarily to medical marijuana. The Box Canyon isn't just that medical marijuana gets stricter and that we're driving our issue into the hands of Big Pharma. It's also that we've intentionally divided our political base 
and created an interest group vested in keeping us in the medical marijuana canyon. I can't think of a single legalizer that ever campaigned against a medical marijuana law, but I can name plenty of medicalizers who campaigned against a legalization law. It's also fostered in that interest group an almost holy reverence for marijuana that precludes rational compromise for political gain. In previous posts on the Box Canyon, I've noted how possession limits that are a pound and a half in the Pacific Northwest have dwindled to one or two ounces in the latest medical marijuana states. Where most states allow patients to grow some plants for themselves, the latest states force patients to shop at dispensaries. Chronic pain in the latest states gets harder and harder to qualify for. However, there have been some improvements as of late in medical marijuana bills. Most of the newer bills include protections for patients against discrimination in employment, housing, child custody, and organ transplants. Many are excluding patients from DUID charges for marijuana metabolites. Some are including reciprocity for other states' medical marijuana patients to protect them from arrest when they visit. These are all superior clauses to what can be found in the earliest medical marijuana states. The problem is that most Western patients would have trouble qualifying for medical marijuana under these newer laws. So, what's happening now? Well, let's take a look. we got four states currently have medical marijuana bills in play and a bunch of others that are working on it. Illinois is looking at a medical marijuana bill right now that allows two ounces of possession and three mature and three immature plants. The bad news is they've copied Oregon's absurd definition that any plant that is larger than 12 inches tall or wider than 12 inches around is a mature plant, even if it's not budding. Yes, that's the Oregon rule, the 12 inch rule, we call it. The Illinois proposal also contains the usual qualifying conditions, things like cancer, HIV, glaucoma, AIDS, and so forth. But chronic pain and nausea can only qualify if you've tried every other option first and they've failed. Or as I call it, cannabis can only be the medicine of last resort for pain and nausea. The Illinois bill also features reciprocity. This is a good thing for out-of-state patients. It protects against the discriminations in the uh, employment, child custody, uh, organ transplants, and so forth. So that's good. It does have some amendments to the bill, though, that include a three-year sunset clause, which means that medical marijuana will exist for at least three years. At the end of three years, if the legislature doesn't reapprove it, patients will go back to being criminals. Yeah, Illinois is looking at a bill that would allow really, really sick people to get relief for three years and then might lose it. <laughs> they might have to go back to being criminals. Amazing. They also have an amendment in the bill for uh, pro prohibition of driving within 12 hours <laughs> of using cannabis. If you use cannabis within 12 hours, you're not allowed to drive. So if you wake up that day, and uh, I, I guess I guess if you went to sleep, uh, that would be eight hours. And then if you spent the first four hours of your morning in pain, then you'd be allowed to drive. Okay, got it. And it also includes a for, uh, a uh, it forbids dispensaries from making campaign contributions. Why? Why in the world will we forbid dispensaries from making campaign contributions? I'll tell you why. Because that's what they have always feared about marijuana. It's not the fact that marijuana would be legal or people would be using it. It's that the people who support marijuana might have money and political power and might fight for further gains and further liberalization of marijuana laws. That's the only reason they would put this in the Illinois law to prevent to prevent these lawful companies, these lawful organizations from making campaign contributions. It also uh, would set up a non-refundable $5,000 application fee for a dispensary, plus another $20,000 for a license. So you got to bet, you got to turn in your your uh, application with five grand, and you may or may not get a dispensary. They might just reject it, and you're out five grand. So that's the Box Canyon, folks. That's where things get more and more and more restrictive in an effort to try to keep the potheads out. It just makes it harder and harder for legitimate patients to qualify. 
Let's look at the other states. In New York, patients could possess two and a half ounces in the bill that they're considering, but could only grow up to 12 plants if they live more than 25 miles away from a dispensary. This is the halo rule that MPP created for the Arizona 2010 medical marijuana law. Thanks to that provision, patients in Phoenix and Tucson, who have been growing for two years now, are forced to take down their gardens because dispensaries have finally been approved for those cities. And there's no grandfather clause for the people who have already been growing. They had their right to grow, and now they lose it because somebody else needs to make money. And when I asked MPP's representatives about why they had this halo rule for the Arizona law, they actually replied by saying the dispensaries needed to have a viable customer base. Yeah, yeah. Like somebody who sets up a shop to sell marijuana is in danger of not doing good business. They, they need to have a captive audience. That, that was the explanation. But uh, also in the New York rule, they've also included a hardship provision. So if you're really poor or you have some other hardship, you can still be allowed to grow your plants, even if you live within the halo. In Ohio, they're looking at a medical marijuana bill that is very broad, actually, with six ounces of possession. Actually, it's 200 grams of possession and 12 plants allowed, including a scientifically accurate description of what a mature plant is. You know, one that actually is budding. It also includes all the standard conditions for medical marijuana qualification and a few that are not included in the early medical marijuana states. It also includes reciprocity and most of the discrimination protections except for the one on organ transplants. If Ohio's medical marijuana were to pass, this would repudiate the Box Canyon theory because this is actually a more liberal law than most medical marijuana laws. And finally, in Pennsylvania, they're considering a bill that would allow for one ounce and six plants and it also include dispensaries. It includes the standard list of qualifying conditions, but would provide patients nothing in the way of discrimination protections. That's the Box Canyon 3 post, Trends in Medical Marijuana Legislation. You can find that at our blog at RadicalRust.com, including links back to those four states' bills, Illinois, New York, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, if you'd like to read them for yourself and find out what they're including in their medical marijuana considerations. Now, the Box Canyon theory is not to say that all states should back away from doing medical marijuana. There's going to be some states where it's the only possible way forward, and I totally understand that. But I truly believe in the West, it is time to stop tinkering around with medical marijuana in California and Oregon especially, and move full bore into legalization of marijuana for all people. Let's end the discrimination against all people who use cannabis. All use is none yet. Thanks for joining us here for the Russ Balbell Show. Those of you listening on the podcast, thanks for joining us. We're going to turn into Hour 2, which is also available as a podcast for our VIP members. If you go to RadicalRust.com slash donate... You can sign up for your VIP membership, which gives you access to all of the Hour 2 Toker Talk Radio downloads, as well as access to the daily Toker Tune downloads at RadicalRust.com. For Brian the Red, I'm Radical Rust. Thanks for joining us. Stick around for Hour 2. we got a whole lot more to talk about. And until next time, take care of each other, Tokers. This is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. You take a scene, you manage, you grow it, you giant, you